Thanks for joining me today. I want to welcome back all the subscribers and I'm really excited for the conversations that have been going on in the comments section. Uh, we've had some wonderful contributions. People have by and large been very respectful uh, with their comments, even when asking questions. So thank you for that. I appreciate those who have contributed. I also want to welcome new people, new listeners. Uh, if you are new here, I want to warn you, this channel is not for the faint of heart. You need to be courageous. You need to have a backbone. And you need to have a spirit that seeks after truth because we strip back the illusions of this world, in particular within the LDS religion. But the things that we talk about here can cross over into other religious organizations that you might be trying to break away from. Today, we are going to be talking about symbolism. Now, several years ago, I put out two videos that talked about symbolism, parts one and two. Uh, you will probably want to go back and do a little refresher there, but today we're going to cover maybe one or two of those uh, symbols that I talked about previously, but uh, we're gonna get into some pictures that a viewer sent to me. Now, this viewer needs to remain anonymous, so I'm not going to be referring to that person as a he or a she, just to maintain anonymity. Uh, so the sentence structure is gonna be a little bit weird. I'm gonna have to say things like they or them, um, which will probably be a really great example of why these types of pronouns are stupid. So so don't get me started on pronoun usage, but for the sake of not revealing this person's identity, that's what we're doing today. This individual is a former employee of the church, and they were kind enough to send me many pictures that they had taken. So what I'm going to do is just get right into screen sharing, and if you will give me just a moment, we're going to pull up a file that I have created. Um, this individual has sent me probably a hundred pictures. Hopefully you guys can, can see this now. Let's see. Okay, here we go. I've got to clean my glasses real quick because I noticed I grabbed it in the wrong spot. <clears throat> but Right up here at the top, we're actually going to start, let me just uh, get rid of my face. So hopefully you can hear me, but you don't need to see me. We are going to start with this picture of the, of the tunnel that I showed while I was in the interview with Asia. One of the comments below asked me to highlight this picture so you guys can get a better look at it. There we go. There we go. All right, it's pretty detailed actually when you blow it up. I'm going to, I'm gonna to continue to zero in on this. Oh, you know what I didn't notice before? Look at the grading down here. This is a ventilation system all along the bottom. You see that? And then if you look at the top, I've got my cursor going along the ventilation system and that would indicate that there are levels above and below. And if you'll remember that uh, Christy Allen, as well as Asia Rain have both mentioned uh, the tunnel system, the networking system below ground that actually uh, is at least three layers deep that they, that they recall. So that's very interesting. Hopefully at some point we will be able to get uh, some more pictures of the tunnel system. Now, just so you know, the four areas that we are going to be taking a look at will be pictures from Eagle Gate Monument, the Joseph Smith Memorial Building, the Lion House, and the Church Administration Building. And so what we're going to do is start with this picture right here. These pictures are not in any particular order. They are random. So we are just gonna pull them up one at a time and talk about the symbolism that we see in each of these photos. And so we're gonna be doing a little bit of skipping around. Now, um, 
just so you guys understand, there can be multiple meanings to one symbol. Iconography is very complex. And so what we're going to be doing when we break down the meaning of the symbols is we're going to go back as far as we can in their origin so we can get the most true meaning. But we also have to take the context into consideration. How is this being used? So we will be looking at that and who put these symbols in place. That's also going to give us a, a really good idea of um, the meaning of the symbols. Now we're going to start at the top with the eagle. It's a very uh, American pie, USA symbol. Of course, we see it on the dollar and in a lot of our government um, symbols. The eagle is a symbol of strength, of power, of farsightedness, and even immortality. However, in Greek and Roman mythology, the eagle was known as Jupiter's personal messenger. And if you recall, Joseph Smith uh, died with the Jupiter's coin in his pocket. I have no idea if there's a coincidence or not there, but just something worth, worth noting. Uh, oftentimes in Freemasonry, you're going to see a double-headed eagle, which is uh, really present in the Scottish Rite Freemasonry once you get to the 32nd degree. And according to the Masons, the double-headed eagle symbolizes both material and spiritual powers working together. Uh, one of the heads symbolizes material world or that which the physical power lies, and the other head symbolizes spiritual divine power. The two heads are also believed to be the symbol of power and justice. So that's quite a bit about the eagle, and we're going to see more eagle symbolism as we continue to move forward. Now, right here, the eagle is sitting on, that is the beehive. Can you see that? There we go, let me blow that up a bit. And actually we've got another picture right here. Let's let's pull up this picture. Oh, that's a good one. All right, and we did talk earlier on in a previous video about the beehive symbolizing the 13th bloodline, which is known as the Merovingian bloodline. And I don't want to repeat myself too much. You guys go back, listen to part parts one and two, because I'm going to explain a lot about the beehive, but this is in reference. The beehive is not because Mormons are an industrial people. It's representing their royal bloodline, both for Christ and Satan or Lucifer, which are said to come from the same bloodline. And then down here, this is what's particularly interesting. And I hope you guys will take a look at this inverted pentagram. We're going to talk about the typical inverted pentagram, but right here, this pentagram inside of this trapezoid, it's not the most notorious symbol for Satanism, which is why they don't use it as much as the one that's uh, enclosed in a circle, which we'll see later. Um, but this one is actually the most powerful satanic symbol. And so I, I find that interesting that we see that on Eagle's Gate or Eagle Gate. Okay, so let's let's scroll down here a little bit. Right here, we're gonna pull up Lion House. Okay, not a whole lot going on here, except for this lion, which most people might, might think is innocuous. We're going to talk more about the lion in, in just a moment, in particular, the lion paw, the lion's paw. Um, but uh, we'll just remember, we'll come back and revisit the lion. But let's uh, let's move on to our next picture. Okay, this we're gonna we're gonna pull up this picture right here. This is the church administration building. Okay, so there's a lot going on here, and we're gonna break it down uh, in a, a more close up type of way. But the reason I wanted to pull up this picture is so you can see the whole front as it is. Okay. Oh, look, there's a forty seven. I didn't notice that before. Okay, in numerology, let's quickly just cover this. The four and the seven, numerologically speaking, would be 
and 11. It's considered a master number, which is the energy of great spiritual enlightenment. It's master intuition and the gift of visions. So of course, prophets being prophetic and the gift of vision, visions and seers. Uh, I would imagine it is not a surprise or by accident that numerologically this building is a master number 11. It's said to be a number of wisdom, to have the ability of prophetic dreams, premonitions, and psychic abilities. So that's a, that's a funny little treat I wasn't expecting. Okay, we are going to break down this border up here in just a minute. We're going to talk about these oak leaves. But what I want to point out here, I'm not even sure what to call this, this little stand here because down here is where we're going to really get into the meaning of the lion's paw. But I just wanted you to see the whole picture as it stands. Okay, so let's pull up a close up of that little thing that's sitting in the front. I'm not even sure what you would call this, but there is a lot happening in this picture right now. Um, one of the things that I want to pull, um, to draw your attention to is this border. We see this border a lot with, in Greek and Roman type of architecture. Uh, I call it the Greek border of the gods uh, because it symbolizes infinity and the eternal motion of things. When you understand the presidents of the church and much of the higher leadership come through the Merovingian bloodline, which is considered to be a royal bloodline, and the church do doctrine teaches the potential to become gods and goddesses, priests and priestesses, then it's no surprise that they would actually use the Greek border of the gods to symbolize their godhead in much of their architecture so just recognize when you're looking at uh this type of stuff whether it's in the joseph smith building um the visitor center that none of this stuff is there by accident everything has been put there specifically and deliberately because it does have a meaning our task is to figure out what the, the iconography is, what, the, what it symbolizes. We know that a picture is worth a thousand words. And so the symbols when, will actually convey a myriad of meanings to the subconscious mind that your conscious mind is completely oblivious to. So let's let's move to this ram. Uh, the ram has an ancient and rich history. It originally comes from Egypt. They use a lot of astrology symbolism in their architecture. Uh, astrologically, Aries means ram in Latin, and the symbol for Aries is the ram. So it's important. Um, it's so important that Egyptian pharaohs were also named after them. So if you think that, uh, think of Ramesses, Ram is the root of Ramesses as well as Pyramid, meaning the paternal power of the Ram. And closer to our time frame, if we look at the Freemasons, they honor the symbol of the Ram in the name of their Masonic king known as High Ram Abiff. Um, Christianity is said to have changed this symbol of the ram to um, to be the symbol of the lamb, which we know, of course, represents Jesus Christ. But whereas the founders of the LDS church and most likely the leaders of the church today are all Freemasons, I'm actually inclined to believe the original meaning of the ram is paying homage to High Ram Abiff or High Ram Abiff. Now, when the individual sent me all these photos, one of the things that uh, they indicated was the fact that they thought that they saw maybe a 666 six, six in the eye. Um, because there, when you look back at the photo, there are several Rams heads all in a row. And so seeing a six in the eye and three of them would indicate 666. Six, six. As I look at this picture, I don't know that I see that. I want you guys to take a look at this. To me, it looks like a spiral, although I guess I can see how that can be the shape of a six, but I don't know. You guys take a look at it. 
leave your comments, your thoughts, and uh, tell me what it is that you see. Okay, so let's move on here. We've got, this is just a different, a different angle. We've got the ram's head here. It really is, I mean, the, the structure of it is really beautiful, despite the meaning. Okay, let's, let's move on here. Let's look at these columns. Now, this is, let me pull this up. This is a picture of the administration building. There are a lot of things going on in this picture, believe it or not. Let's see, let's first take a look at these columns, which, um, you know, most people might not think twice about, but these Roman or Greek columns, um, what they represent, this vertical type of column or pillar, uh, what it represents is the division between two realms of heaven and earth. It represents the bridge. It can represent either the bridge uh, between heaven and earth, or it can be the dividing of heaven and earth. Okay, there's really not enough context here to determine, if any, what the indication might be referencing. Um, in Freemasonry, oftentimes you will see two pillars known as Yakim and Boaz. Uh, we, we really don't have enough information to, to decipher the full meaning of what that is. Okay, let's pull it. Oh, you know what? I think we have a better picture. I was going to show you some oak, some oak wreaths here, but let's move on. And I, I'm pretty sure I've got a more clear picture down here. Okay, this is, now I am on the fence about this and maybe there's a different picture. Let's try, nope. Bear with me guys we're gonna we're gonna find the right picture oh this one's a pretty good one now i am not clear if this is a gargoyle or if it is the head of a lion um over here around the outside this kind of mane type of thing looks to me like a lion but look at this mouth the whole face it, it just looks like a gargoyle, which is actually not uncommon to find gargoyles on top of temples and church houses. Gargoyles were often modeled after cre um, creatures that were worshipped by pagan tribes in order to draw them inside of the church. In folklore, gargoyles are thought to ward off harmful spirits. And with their mouths wide open the way this one is, see how open it is? You can see the teeth. Here, this symbolizes the devouring of giants. So that's why I think this it, it maybe is more symbolic of a gargoyle uh, than representative of a lion. Um, it also was placed at the top of a temple or a church building. Um, it acts as a reminder of the hell that will await a person if they do not attend church. So it's it's actually quite a creepy a uh, symbol. Okay, let's let's move down over here. Okay, right here is a really good picture of a wreath. Now we're going to stop for just a moment and talk about the importance of uh, oak leaves and acorns, uh, both just as a leaf and then as a wreath, because we're going to see a lot of it when we go into the Joseph Smith Memorial Building. So I just want to go over a few things here. The oak leaf has a number of meanings, and of course I can't cover them all. I'm just going to touch on the most probable uh, with the Masonic and the occult meaning, since that is the context of of the Mormon leadership and the founders. The acorn is the seed of the mighty, and we're gonna see a lot of acorns in just a little bit. The oak tree, therefore, um, you know, it symbolizes strength, potential for um, fertility, stability, and longevity. Great things are said to come from small things, and the oak tree comes 
from the acorn. So they are paired together, but just in different stages. Oak leaves represent strength, stability, and nobility. And here again, we have nobility, bloodline, reference to godhood. Romans and Greeks and ancient gods are depicted uh, wearing crowns of oak leaves as a symbol of their godhood. So I want you to bear that in mind uh, as we move forward. These men believe themselves to be gods, and it is um, it's evident in the things that they say, and it's evident in the symbolism that they adorn themselves with and surround themselves with, including the church um, edifices. When oak leaves and acorns are combined, the entire symbol stands for power, authority, and victory. And what do we understand from the Mormon church is that we they have authority over us. Um, and we give that to them. It's also for this reason that the military uses oak leaves on their uniforms, their hats, it can be seen on their tombs. And so it's not just within a church setting that we see the use of oak leaves, acorns, and wreaths. We see this in military and government as well. The leaf or the wreath in particular, when the, when the leaf um, is in this round shape, right here, just like you would hang on your door, it becomes a crown of wisdom and glory, just as we were talking about a minute ago. And it can also symbolize eternal life and divinity, which is right in keeping with their belief system. Okay. I want to, I want to pull up this corner right here. This is very interesting. There is a lot happening here. I see a lotus flower. Okay, I see a pine cone. And I see the winged sun, which we are going to get into in just a moment. I'm going to save the pine cone for just a minute. I might even save the winged sun. But let's talk a little bit about the lotus flower, because I think this is one of the only places we're going to see this at. Um, I This looks like we blow this up and look real closely. This looks like the lotus flower as well, uh, which represents being reborn moving from the darkness into the light. Uh, in different cultures, the lotus flower, when it is presented in different colors, it actually has uh, varying meanings. The lotus represents purity, spiritual ascension, divinity, and fertility. Well, here we have fertility again. I'm seeing a common theme, and we're going to continue to see fertility because, you know, of course, we know the, the Mormons do a lot of sex magic, uh, the, satan the satanic aspect of Mormonism uh, uses a lot of sex rituals. So we see we see this represented in the lotus flower. Um, resurrection is also a possible meaning, which is interesting given the LDS doctrine on re resurrection. Okay, let's let's move down here. There is a lot going on in this picture. Holy smokes. We're going to be here a minute. Okay. So what I want to point out are a couple of things. We have a lot of satanic symbolism just in this frame. Um we talked about the inverted pentagram in the trapezoid, which we see right here, the trapezoid portion is a, is very faded, but the star, the pentagram is actually the same. Right next to it over here, let's talk about this. Um, you know, in, in the video that I did before, we talked about each point represents a particular element that would be earth air water fire and spirit inverted pentagrams are used in black magic and uh they particular let's see this right here this point coming down this is the spirit facing downward which represents the fall of the morning sun or star okay so that's very symbolic 
right there. This is the most well-known satanic pentagram or symbol, which is why it's used on the satanic Bible. And as I mentioned just a few minutes before, it's not the most powerful. This one right here is considered the most powerful, but this one over here to the left is the most common. Okay. Um, you'll find the inverted pen pentagram um, in a lot of satanic paraphernalia on the Bible we just mentioned, but it's also the symbol for the third degree or the sublime degree of Freemasonry representing the craft. So what's it doing on an LDS church building? That's a good question, isn't it? Now let's, uh, let's come over here to the opposite side. You see what we have here? If you'll recall from um, a previous video, we talked about Baal. Uh, and there are a couple of different ways that we can pronounce Baal or Baal. Um, either one, I think, is acceptable. But this is sun worship. We have more sun worship here. Okay. Um, now, this is a Phoenician symbol for sun god. And I'm point, I'm coming right up here with the smiley face in the sun. Uh, it's one of the oldest symbols that crosses many cultures. So you're going to get a variety of meaning meanings, but the origin is uh, Phoenician and it does represent Baal. Baal was the god of fertility and prosperity. Part of Baal worship is sex orgies. Here again, we have sex orgies and sacrificing of infants. And what are we seeing an abundance of today? The sacrifice of infants and the defense of women's rights to murder their babies. Uh, Baal also has a history of taking the shape of the ram or the bull. So um, as we've already seen the ram um, in some of the iconography, but we're also going to see the bull here in just a few moments. So whether it's the bull, the ram, or the sun as depicted here like this, this is all sun worship. In ancient cultures, um, worship of the sun, um, it, it's a symbol of divinity and enlightenment. Uh, it has a very prolific meaning. And one expression of the solar energy of Solomon or soul of man uh, with the different levels of Freemasonry, they are actually taught the true identity of sun, S-U-N slash S-O-N or Baal. Okay, so that there's a lot to unpack there. Let's move on to this picture right next to it. We have Joseph Smith on his knees with Moroni up there. Okay, and here we have, look at this. This is so interesting right here in this corner. Um, in a lot of this type of architecture, sometimes you will see an all seeing eye, but that is not what I see. If we blow that up, um, what I'm looking at in particular um, looks like the grip or the, the handshake. Okay, what, what do you guys think of that? We're gonna talk about the grip later when we talk about the lion's paw. But to me, that looks like, um, that looks like the, one of the um, handshakes that we would do in the temple. Okay, right here is also, right next to it is an all seeing eye. Can you see that? Uh, or the eye of Horus. It's also known as the eye of Horus, who was a pagan god, son of Osiris and Isis. Horus was one of the most powerful gods of Egypt. He was a sun god. And of course, we're still thinking about Baal and all the reference to sun worship. For a more in-depth, uh, for more in-depth information on the eye of Horus, Horus, you'll want to watch the videos that I did on uh, satanic worship because I do go into depth about that. So let's let's move on here. Um, don't recall if there's anything I wanted to show you on this one. Just um, just a special note, this is representative of the tree of life, or maybe the tree of good and evil. 
So nothing too major there. Here again, we have the four and the seven, the master number 11. Okay, we're gonna see these flowers. I'm not sure if this is supposed to represent a lotus flower or not. Remember what we just talked about with the lotus flower, the purity and everything involved with that. So I, you guys will have to make up your mind whether or not when you see that type of flower, if you think the depiction is that of a lotus flower. Okay, right here, we see this is a depiction of the phase of the moon. The moon represents Semiramis, Tammuz, or Baal's mother which is sun worship. Okay, we have the tabernacle here, but this is this is the ceiling of the tabernacle. And in a lot of the decorations, the architecture, what you're going to find are pine cones. Okay, and although some people might think that pine cones are, you know, why would you decorate with pine cones? And they might, they might not even think anything of it, but it actually has a very interesting representation. Let's, let's move to another picture. Oh, you know what? That's the same thing. All right. There's a lot going on in this picture. I think we'll go back to one of these pictures so we can focus on the meaning of the pine cone. Let's just blow this up because you've got several in these uh, ceiling decorations here. Pine cones represent enlightenment, spirituality, resurrection, and eternal life. We're gonna see a lot of this same type of theme throughout the different iconography and their architecture and decorations because the shape of the pine cone mimics that of the pineal gland, which is tucked away deep inside your head. The cone is another symbol for representing the all seeing eye which has supernatural powers or the ability to see and perceive beyond the physical state or that which is ordinary. So whether you are looking at the all seeing eye or you're looking at a pine cone, the meaning is the same. Okay, uh, so just remember that uh, if you were to look at the Pope's staff, the, he carries around a staff, it has a big old honking pine cone on it, which is strange, right? unless you know the meaning. Uh, they use the pine cone to symbolize his illuminated state and it represents his ability to see beyond the realm. The prophet and his counselors all the way down to your local state president and bishops, they all say that they have the ability to receive revelation and inspiration on behalf of all they are stewards over, um, they are stewards over and this is represented represented by the pine cone. So as we continue to move on into the Joseph Smith building in just a moment, we are going to see a lot of pine cones. I want to come back. Sorry guys, I know this is random. It's all over the place um, because that's, that's how I got the pictures imported. But we're gonna look at this section of this mural right here. We have the pioneers. Nothing seems to be nefarious about that, but the thing that makes me kind of suspicious is when you look down below it in the bottom section, there's a Native American in full regalia. And I think it just probably doesn't sit well with me knowing about the Mountain Meadow, uh, Mountain Meadow Massacre. So you have the pioneers on top making their way you know, into the Salt Lake Valley and along their way, they meet up with Native Americans and um, Brigham Young gives the order to have the Native Americans killed. And I guess it just doesn't sit well with me that now we have a Native American on here knowing that history of the church. So maybe you guys have different thoughts on that. Okay. Um, Right here over in the corner, uh, we're gonna take a look. Do you guys see this right here? It's it's representing, I don't know if you would call that um, wheat or 
um, some sort of grain. That's that's what it is. It's representing some sort of grain. You can get specific if you want to about what that is, but um, we can use the terms interchangeably with corn, barley, um, and so forth. And it's said to represent fertility, bounty, and also resurrection because every spring um, when the fields are planted and um, in the fall time when we have harvest, this is a resurrection type of process. In a religious context where the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is supposedly the only true church on the face of the earth, it can also be said that the wheat is separated from the chaff, which is symbolic of the saints being separated from the Gentiles. Is that a stretch? I really don't know. We would have to ask those who put this together, um, but it is one of the possibilities. Um, it can also represent the bounty that comes, that is said to come from the gospel. There's that possibility. This symbol is also a symbol of God's favor and his grace. So it's open for interpretation. You guys can make up your own mind as far as what that means. And just leave it in the comments below. Okay, I have really wanted to talk about the lion's paw. Finally, here we are. Um, this is so significant. And, this, and one of the reasons why I wanted to point out uh, that thing that those, those um, two things that stand in front of the administration building that had the ram's head on it. And I said, remember the lion's paw for later. Um, one of the reasons why I wanted to point this out is because this particular symbol is rich in meaning. Um, not only do we have the lion's grip or the lion's paw that we do in the temple, but um, we're going to talk about its affiliation in the third degree of Freemasonry. Um, we've got the, the handshake referring to the lion of the tribe of Judah, which in Christianity refers to Jesus Christ. It is a symbol of strength and sovereignty. Now, what I want to do is I'm going to I'm going to grab a paper here because I found something on the lion's it's called the lion's paw blog. So I need to give credit there. And this individual is going to talk specifically about what the lion's paw means. And I'm going to quote, uh, I'm just going to start the quote. It's from Albert Pike in his Morals and Dogma. This gives interpretation of our legend saying, the lion of the house of Judah is the strong grip, never to be broken, with which Christ of the royal line of that house has clasped to himself the whole human race and embraces them in his wide arms as closely and affectionately as brethren embrace each other on the five points of fellowship. And of course, any of us that have gone through the temple, we already know about the five points of fellowship. Continuing on, applying this symbolism to the candidate, meaning the Masonic candidate, it means that he entered the lodge as a natural man, lost in sin and spiritually buried. By the strong grip of the lion's paw, he is raised again to a new life or born again to spiritual righteousness, standing again in a living perpendicular with a purified inner self accomplished through the direct action of the Redeemer, who was the lion of the tribe of Judah. Okay, I want you guys to pay attention to that. Its connection in the legend of masonry is that as Solomon was the chief of the tribe of Judah, the symbolism of the lion represents the achievement of that lion in producing the Christ who has brought all of us the promise of light and the immortality of our soul. So that is pretty heavy, don't you think? And if... I just never understood if these symbols were so important, um, why we were never taught these things in church. Because even though I went through the temple and took out my endowment in 1990, this was not explained in the temple. And I don't think that it was explained to you either. So moving now into the Joseph Smith Memorial Building, it is just rich with symbolism. 
let's pick, let's pick this one up close because there's a lot happening here. We've got enormous pine cones. We have the wreath, the oak wreath up here. Again, we see the eagle. Okay. And then we also have the cherubs, which, uh, you know, people might seem or think that the cherub is nice and sweet. And, and of course it can be, um, but the cherubs are said to be the second highest angels to God. So they're very significant. The Hebrew term uh, cherub means either fullness of knowledge or one who intercedes. And so this would be like the prophet who intercedes or Christ who intercedes um, on your behalf to the father. They represent both guardians and the divine throne. So there's a lot happening in this picture. And of course we see the flower here, the lotus flower. Okay, let's pull up. Let's go with this one. Isn't it beautiful? I mean, the symbolism is one thing, but if you just look at the architecture, it's very beautiful, very ornate. Let's look at this picture over here. I wanna go back and talk about the winged sun. I don't know if I missed that or not. I hope I didn't. I don't want to repeat myself. But while I'm looking at it, let's pull up this picture. Because obviously right here we see the Star of David with the circle around it. Okay. Um, it's also known as the Shield of David. It symbolizes God reaching down to man and man reaching up to God. So there's a symbiotic relationship here representing the union of heaven and earth. It may also symbolize... Um, the tribe of Israel and their affinity towards the Jewish people, which of course we know that it is associated with that. But in esoteric spheres, you also have this triangle right here. See this triangle? And then you've got a second triangle right here. This is the male energy. Wait, you know what? No, I think this is the female energy with the point facing down. And then I do believe the male energy is the triangle with the point facing up. I am pretty certain that that is it. If I have that backwards, um, somebody please throw a comment and uh, we'll get it straightened out. But I'm pretty certain that that is it. Okay. This is the inside of the Joseph Smith memorial building and it just gives you a, a bigger wider view a bigger perspective that is a lot of our tithing money look at that that's pretty amazing isn't it i don't i i remember when i was looking through here and i was putting these pictures into the file um, so that we can have this discussion. Uh, I remembered seeing the winged sun and also Saturn. And I want to see if I can find that. I, oh, here it is. Okay, this, you guys, help me out with your interpretation here. Do you see this right here? This looks like a ring of Saturn taking flight. And it has a very significant occult meaning. Um, Saturn is the god of time or Kronos, which is all, which also means it's the destruction of the material world because material is destroyed by time, and Kronos is the name of the Saturn of Saturn. He is the god of Saturn. He's not a nice god. In fact, uh, Saturn would eat his own children. So he's actually very terrifying. He's very destructive. So the fact that we would have Saturn representation or iconography here is a little bit disturbing. Uh, we also have Saturnalia, which is a Roman festival honoring Saturn or Kronos. So you guys tell me what you think this is, but that definitely looks like Saturn to me. Um, let's see. I want to go back and find the winged sun. Oh, but this just caught my attention. 
this is interesting. Here we have Jesus. Look at that. Jesus finally makes an appearance. Over here, we have the dove symbolizing innocence, purity, rebirth. Okay, and then these are sun rays. Okay, I don't know if these are these little markings here are supposed to represent motion. I would imagine that the dove's wings being outreached or outstretched like this would automatically indicate motion. I don't know if these extra little markings are supposed to indicate motion or if this is supposed to be indicating uh, sunshine of some sort. So that would be another one of these things that's open to interpretation. You guys let me know what you think. And I'm going to backtrack here and see if I can find the winged sun. Okay, we're just gonna go right here because I see it. Although I did see it um, initially when I went through the pictures, I did see it initially in the Joseph Smith Memorial Building. I do believe it was outlined in gold, but since I've got my eyes on it right now, we're just going to go ahead and, and talk about this right here. Do you see that? Okay, this is, this is the winged sun. Okay. All right. I just wanted to point that out. Um, you know, one of the things that this person that said, um, sent this information to me, um, said is they were amazed at how much had been right in front of them the entire time and they hadn't seen it and now with the understanding of symbolism there's so much more that that they can see inside of the meaning um okay let's i found i found my notes on the winged sun so i i just want to cover this real quick um uh Anything having to do with the sun, S-U-N, can also be in reference to the sun, S-O-N. These things are interchangeable uh, symbolically, especially when you go back to the time of Egypt, Sumeria, and uh, even before that, you know, the Sumerian um, Phoenician time period, okay? Um, so it is also in reference to the soul or without a physical body and by extension eternal life so there's a lot going on just right here um, especially if placed above temple doors or edifices this can connote a spiritual or religious meaning which of course we see that this is um, in this context, I think the sun could be referring to the sun god Ra. We have to, uh, rather than Baal, you have to remember that Egyptians were polytheistic, but not all their gods are equal in significance. So it also indicates a layering of, of meaning or elevation or enlightenment, just like the three degrees of glory in Mormonism. Okay, so let's... Let's wrap this up. I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop sharing. There we go. Okay, we're back. I hope you guys enjoyed that. It was very informal. However, I wanted to just go through a lot of these fantastic pictures so that you guys can see the symbolism and hopefully look at it from a new perspective, broaden your understanding of these symbols that have been in front of us our whole lives, um, some of us, or individuals that live in the area, if you live around a temple, I would encourage you to go to these church buildings, take pictures, figure out what they're actually saying to you, um, because it's more than what you realize. I promise you that a picture is worth a thousand words and what your subconscious is understanding from uh, these symbols is much greater than your conscious mind is picking up. If you guys have any questions, you know, to reach me at galacticstoryteller at gmail.com. I so appreciate you guys joining me today. Please leave your comments below, like and subscribe.
I ask two things. Please be kind uh, and provide references and resources. It's okay to have a difference of opinion. Just be respectful about it. Provide some resources so that we can open a dialogue and uh, have a conversation about what these things mean. I'm looking forward to hearing from you. You guys have a fantastic uh, week and we will see you in the next video.